you know the section on the dialectic in the sophist? Okay. I don't. I came up with nothing for that question. Did you want to mention any of the things that were discussed earlier? That's good. Earlier? That's just chatter. Okay. No. That's good. Okay, hey. we're on a subject that has a long, <coughs> curious history. By the way, even Carl Jung has a section on the dialectic, which is eminently worth looking at. But it is greatly different than Platonic. Now, if the sophist is from Ila, which is the center of Parmenidean thought, we can assume that maybe he knows something about Parmenides' thought. Is that hers or mine? Oh, that would be yours. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it here. It's so funny. You can't remember the dog. He doesn't need it. What are you doing? So what we want to do is to go to Parmenides and review what it is Parmenides says is the dialectic. All right? Now I know a good number of you have the text of the Parmenides, oh, no. right? And we can easily get it. But let me ask you this. Does the dialectic presuppose a structure? And right. a kind of structure that will unfold the truth of an idea. And in order to do that, of course, in the structure, he has to have
as I've argued in the signal show, why something can be asserted positively and negatively. And he says, unless you're willing to, to learn and understand classes, function and the role of self-reflection in Greek called Russia. That is the ability to turn upon an idea and uncover its, its dimensions. As an example, Parmenides is talking to Socrates and he says, you know, the problem you're having in philosophy is that you don't understand how to understand classes of ideas and you don't understand usia, sometimes called essence, but self-reflection. And unless you understand those two things, you cannot possibly discover the truth about any idea. So, now what's an idea? Pure ideas inferred from the nature of pure being. Which is called the most luminous light of being. That's one class of ideas. Among them, Okay.
another set of ideas. They're called relational ideas. All right? These are different classes of ideas. Therefore, when Parmenides is asked to give an example of his own idea, he says, I'll share my own. And therefore he goes for the highest possible idea, the nature of the good itself or the one. In his analysis, using only these terms, relational terms, he shows It shows that none of the relational terms can be applied to the one. Therefore, it's a negative conclusion. That is objected to, and therefore he advances, if this can be rejected, then the possible alternatives must be explored rigorously for their meaning. Right. If one is, then what is the nature of what's other than the one? Yeah. Um, what is that RT in the first? Relational terms. Oh. <laughs> Relational terms. Okay. Not to do this systematically?
positive and negative terms. There are four variations positively, four variations negatively. Next. Any of the terms within these, we're calling these the hypotheses. can be explored individually by the dialectic for single ideas. So therefore, he can take internally Internally, you can take the two ideas like and unlike and subject any of these terms, but he uses these in, a, in an example for a special dialectic, and that is what you're familiar with when you have to take an idea <coughs> and express it in four categories making three points number one things you say about it that are true the second is always things about it which you could not say are true about it. Three, things that are both true and false about it. Then you repeat the same thing with the assertion, but if it does not exist, what would be the consequences? Therefore, in this dialectic, you end up with 12 positive, 12 negative assertions, or 24 ideas expressed dialectically under the idea of likeness. Now, in the reasoning within the hypotheses, must be be shown to fit within the particular hypothesis
and show its rational necessity. And the entire thing must be explored through dialogue. Right. How come he doesn't do that? How come Parmenides doesn't do that specifically, all 12 times 12 times each of those ideas for each of the hypotheses? Yes. He, sh he could have. He could have. There was the option. But later thinkers in the Platonic game see that this is presumed to be true and they do it. Yeah, good I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm with them. Yeah, that's true. <coughs> so we learn more about Plato from Proclus than we get in Plato. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. But David, are you asking... Uh, I'm sort of observing in a way. I'm not really asking. No, it's good. Doesn't, doesn't Proclus say uh, that kind of what you're saying, David, that... Um, that Parmenides could have gone through all 24 with the eight hypotheses, but actually if you... With each of the terms in the eight hypotheses. Right. Appropriate to each hypothesis. Yes. Well, then we may be talking about something different, but I, I thought Proclus says somewhere in there that actually Parmenides only does a subset of the 24. We've seen that in the actual dialogue, right? I mean, and that's what we see when we read. Right? And is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just kind of observing that he didn't do that. And why? Not really why. <coughs> well, you're not asking okay. because I, I can't presume. No, to no. Assume. Look, okay. the reason is because all he needed to do is the first hypothesis and end it. That would be taking an idea and treating it dialectically. It's only because Aristotle says, oh no, I can't go along with that, that Parmenides then takes on the effort to do it. But now notice why he has to do it within this structure. Because it is not a single idea. It's a relational idea. All of these hypotheses must be a relational idea. That is, if the one is, then what of the others? The four variations of that, see it's relational, two ideas, one and other, taken positively and negatively, will get you the four. with one provision in it. You need an extra category of appearance and reality. But let me leave that out for a moment, all right? So each of these, and the, to explore the hypotheses, it is not a single term, but always a relationship between one and others. If it stood alone, then he would use the 24. But you cannot use the 24 if it's all negative. Therefore, there are three kinds of dialectic in the Parmenides. Parmenides, Zeno's, and Mina and, and Parmenides is correction of Zeno's. They're all different. If you want to look for distinctions within the dialectic. All right, now. So you're saying that, you're saying that if we take like, likeness, 
then we if lightness exists and when it does not exist and then we have those 12 then we take unlikeness as a single idea not no those are two different ideas like and unlike okay yeah therefore he's going to do this exploration with each one separately the negatives are and what if likeness does not exist that's not the same thing as unlikeness. Okay? Yeah, okay. To see that, uh, I could show you. But right okay. now, yeah. And, or well, you can look for it yourself. It's in Proclus. That is to say there's a different dialectic for likeness and unlikeness different dialectic for that which is not like and unlikeness. Motion. And motion and rest can equally. Soul is another single term. Single term, 24. Single, single ideas. Oh. Right? Thank now, you. the sophist, he's familiar. He's familiar. He knows. He knows this game. All right? Now, when we take a look now at the sophist and his understanding of the dialectic, one thing is very clear is that he shows no argument for the justification for any of the ideas he explores. Right, Barbara? Right. She went through it, she, she found it as well. That he has no reasonable, rational argument to justify each of the major points he's making. Right. Second, there is no use of usia, self-reflection. That term is entirely missing. Second, he doesn't have the structure. He, he says he has a dialectic. Uh, Barbara, what, what have you seen so far in the dialectic of the, the sophist? I think all of us have seen it. That there really isn't, there's no, no evidence of any methodology of dialectic no methodology, no rational arguments for each of the positions he holds. Okay, one more thing. Watch now. We are now at the point in the sophists where he's going to talk about, and many so-called philosophers accept this. This is what he calls ideas. Notice our first category of ideas he does not use. Yeah. Before you can begin. Second, he tries to use the relational ideas without giving any explanation for any of them. Damn. The stranger. Now, with this list, uh, there's only one term out of all of them that we would call as appropriate as the so-called eternal ideas or the primary ideas being. I'm sorry, could you repeat that here? So 
there only one term? He, he, he uses only what ch which category of ideas? This term is the only term among the ideas we call primary ideas. He doesn't use any of the others. Being. Doesn't use truth, reality, beauty. Well, reality and being are the same, aren't they? Well, it depends on what translation you use. That's why I put it that way. Some people put the word reality, some people put the word being, so I put them both. So, shall we now go into the sophist? Yeah. All right? Have a good place where we've left off? Yes. Mm -hmm. Two, we left off at 242A. But he's now going to attack Parmenides. That's right, 242. Well, that's where he's at. Oh, uh, you were looking for dialectic earlier? Yes. It's uh, on. Uh, it comes before it. Yeah, go ahead. Parmenides was rather careless. I was wondering, Pierre, if you meant 242C, 243A. Well, the dialectic. Pardon? I was wondering if you meant this page for the dialectic. Yes, that's good. What page? Page 359. 242C? To 243A. The entire section. Well, he chastises. Yeah. No, uh, he, no. he no he he uses the term. He uses the term, right? I couldn't find that. Um, it's there. Did you? Did you? Barbara has it. No, I she has the T L. But I thought I could find it. Well, I thought so too. This is not my book, so. Did you catch it, Barbara, on the... Not at the moment. She's going to do a TLG search. She's going to do a search on yes. the TLG. Yeah. But it takes a while. Thank you. 
50 all down like that. Ah, got it. Two fifty four. Page two fifty four. Stephanus. Stephanus number two fifty four. Now, you have to go back to um, D, prior. E5. Then Theotetus. Oh, yes. <laughs> Got it? E5. Yeah. OK, let's get a couple of readers, and let's play. Oh, weird. I'll read. Thank you. I'll answer you. OK, good. I have a list. Then Theotetus, what name shall we give to this science? Or by Zeus, have we unwittingly stumbled upon the science that belongs to free men and perhaps found the philosopher while we were looking for the sophist? What do you mean? Shall we not say that the division of things by classes and the avoidance of the belief that the same class is another or another the same belongs to the science of dialectic? Yes, we shall. Mm -hmm. Keep going. He who is able to do this has a clear perception of one form or idea extending entirely through many individuals, each of which lies apart, and of many forms differing from one another, but included in one greater form, and again of one form evolved by the union of many wholes, <clears throat> and of many forms entirely apart and separate. This is the knowledge and ability to distinguish by classes how individual things can or cannot be associated with one another. Certainly it is. But you surely, I suppose, will not grant the art of dialectic to any but the man who pursues philosophy in purity and righteousness. How could it be granted to anyone else? OK, look, let's go back. I presume you'd say he's making three points when he's making the first distinction in the game of dialectic. Would you agree? Shall we not say that the division of things by classes, okay? Notice he does not include Usia. Right. All right, here they are. The division of things by classes Two, the avoidance of the belief that some class is another. Or another, the same belongs to the science of dialectic. Is there three then? Mm -hmm. Right? He must know the division of things by classes and the avoidance of the belief that some class is another? If you know the division of by classes, would you not necessarily avoid the, that one class is another? Yep. Therefore, he is not adding anything. No. But he may with the third. Let's see if he got as a third. Damn. And the avoidance of the belief that some class is another or another the same. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing that's, there. That's it. Therefore, he only has one class. Yeah, I was going for my yeah. wallet. He's multiplying classes that are there where there is no difference. 
Let's look at the next point he makes. Then, he who is able to do this has a clear perception of one form or idea extending entirely through many individuals, each of which lies apart, one, and of the many forms differing from one another, two, but included in the greater form, and again, one form evolved by the union of many wholes, three, right? And by God, he has a fourth. And those forms which are entirely apart and separate. This is the knowledge and ability to distinguish by classes. That's what he calls it. All right? OK, we have to take a look at it. This now is called the ability to distinguish by classes. Okay. How one form extends entirely through many particulars. Yes. He's repeating himself. Repeating himself. Four times. Yeah. Hey, look. <clears throat> Is he even distinguishing classes? What is a class? What kinds of members belong in a class? Shouldn't that be the discussion? Rather, he's talking about one form or idea and how it is extended into many particulars. That's not, telling, that's not distinguishing by classes. That's saying there's a certain class that has a certain function. You could look at our list and take beauty, right? Beauty can be said to be extended to many particulars. Yeah, that makes sense. But is that a class? Is that giving us, explaining to us what this ability is of distinguishing by classes? No. Right? And the next line is even weird. The next line is even more weird. Go ahead. Many, yeah. not distinguishing any class among them, and yeah. then just lumping them into one form. Yes. His goal. Assuming that he's making a yeah. distinction. Yes, yeah. his goal is to do this. Is he doing it? No. No. Curious? Mm -hmm. Now. I just would like to stay with his first great point. Right? The many forms Good, good, sir. Share it. Okay, 
the first point is he's talking about these forms, and the first one he has is the idea extending entirely right, uh, through, through entirely through many individuals, each of which lies apart. They're separate, okay? Ideas are separate. Yes. Um. Oh, okay. I'm ge I'm getting ahead of myself. Um. Let's do the next line. Let's get our readers to continue. Certainly, it is. But you surely, I suppose, will not grant the art of dialectic to any but the man who pursues philosophy in purity and righteousness. How could it be granted to anyone else? Then it is in some region like this that we shall always, both now and hereafter, discover the philosopher if we look for him. He also is hard to see clearly. But the difficulty is not the same in his case as that of the sophist. I'm going to read that chart. So, uh, were we talking about the subject, the ability to distinguish according to classes? Did he switch the subject? Mm, yep. That's the nature of a philosopher? Yeah. Ah, he left that subject? Yep. Good. Let's go further and pick up the next subject. Go ahead. The sophist runs away into the darkness of not being, feeling his way in it by practice. And it is hard to discern on account of the darkness of the place. Don't you think so? It seems likely. Has he mentioned what practice? No. Go ahead. But the philosopher? But the philosopher, always devoting himself through reason to the idea of being, <clears throat> is also very difficult to see on account of the brilliant light of the place. For the eyes of the soul of the multitude are not strong enough to endure the sight of the divine. This also seems... Um, what do you think of that? What do you think of that as reason? it sounds lovely. Yeah, what do you think of the reasoning? I don't know if it's reasoning, but... He claims the multitude... <laughs> he, he claims the multitude for not being able to distinguish the philosopher. That's all. And that's all he's got. That's all he's got. As he described who the philosopher is, as he pointed out that the mob can't perceive him. Uh, did he describe what the philosopher is then, be, uh, other than calling the man uh, uh, grand and righteous? Okay, let's go. This also seems no less true than what you said about the sophists. Now we will make more <laughs> accurate investigations. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Now we will make more accurate investigations about the philosopher hereafter, if we still care to do so. But as to the sophists, it is clear that we must not relax our efforts until we have a satisfactory view of him. You are right. Since, therefore, we are agreed that some of the classes will mingle with one another and others will not, and some will mingle with few and others with many, and that there is nothing to hinder some from mingling universally with all, let us next proceed with our discussion by investigating not all the forms or ideas, lest we become confused among so many, <laughs> but some only selecting them from those that are considered the most important. Let us first consider their several natures and what their power of mingling with each other is. And so, if we cannot grasp being and not being with perfect clearness, we shall at any rate not fail to reason fully about them, so far as the method of our present inquiry permits. 
Let us in this way see whether it is, after all, permitted us to say that not being really is, although not being, and yet come off unscathed. Yes, and that is the proper thing for us to do. Would you agree we now have a platform he put forward? We have everything we need. All we need now, we have to use this as a report card and see whether he fulfills the conditions on that page. We finally got him, don't we? This is, I, I just have to go back to these two paragraphs regarding the darkness and the brilliant light. It's almost like a joke he's pulling. Or, or it's funny because the sophist runs into the darkness and it's hard to discern on account of the darkness. But then the philosopher who spends his time devoting himself to reason to the idea of being is also very difficult to see on account of the brilliant light. But you'd think that that would be possible to see him even. But he's making it very uh, empirical. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the, goes, the difficulty is primarily for the ignorant, the yeah, masses. And then he goes and says, for the eyes of the soul of the multitude are not strong enough to endure the sight of the divine. Yeah, yeah. But then they should be able to see the sophist. It's a little darker. Yeah. They can't, Absolutely you know, they can't right. see the, in yeah. the light, then they should be able to find the sophist. Very good point. You're, lay, you're staying you. with it. You're making conclusions <laughs> from it. Yeah. And it's kind yeah. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So would you agree we now have to isolate the points exactly at that section and set up a report card? Mm -hmm. Set up a report card. All right. That's what we'll do next week. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay? You got the job? Got the work? No. Would you agree he sets out his goal in the paragraph we just read? Yeah, that's 254 BC. Mm -hmm. He's now going to talk about classes, is he not? Oh, let us next proceed. Yeah. Well, and his, this, in other words, he goes back to this point where he's talking about the ability to distinguish classes. He's going to stick with being and non-being, though. That's right. He, he's kind of eliminated the other two. Too numerous to, and he's going to say with those which are most important and most clear, and then he jumps on being and non-being. Right. That's weird, isn't it? It's going to get worse when I see you next Friday. Okay. Oh, being and rest and motion. Yes. Okay. Fun. Right. Yeah. Um, is he doing something a little different than what Parmenides is doing? He's, he's rejecting the idea of, of going through each idea individually and seeing how each idea functions. He's saying that very process is confusing, let's not do it. That's right. Let's just take the top two That's right. out of the pot and not do the 24. And we're not going to do this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's what he's doing. He's rejecting the method of Parmenides in that paragraph. Yeah. Okay. Fun. Thank you. Gee, I'd like to meet a real philosopher who likes the sophists and find out what they have to say. Now I'm very curious. Well, I like the there, there, By the way, I looked at the internet. There's tons of arguments about how this, the dialectic in the sophist proves this and that and the other thing. So there's yeah. plenty to read. Yeah, they're all over. The report of these. Yeah. yeah, good. I should. Come tomorrow? How?